Okay, well, thank you, Ian, and, and thank you for the uh, organizers, the triumvirate that's sitting over here, um, <coughs> for really a remarkable conference. I, I really appreciate what you've done and look forward to what's going to happen in the future, and I'm honored to be here. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I have to apologize. I need to walk around a bit because my neck doesn't work too well uh, due to an, uh, an accident on my interface. I'll explain that later on. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, this talk's called Structure Invention by Conscious Agents. Um, and I'm, I'm introducing what's called the interface theory of perception um, and the notion of conscious realism. Um, <coughs> it's going to be in two parts. And in the first part, I will show, not in this talk, but in the first part, sorry about that, I'll show that evolution by natural selection entails that physicalism is false. Um, and I hope to convince you of that. I, uh, you know, but hope springs eternal. Anyway, um, so what do I mean by physicalism, in particular physicalist theories? Uh, I mean that perception is considered, and I'm going to concentrate on perception for now. Perception is considered to be a reconstruction of an objective world, okay? And so there are certain assumptions that go along with this, which is, first of all, that our, our perceptions estimate true properties of the physical world. Um, <clears throat> and we've been hearing that a lot this week. Um, and, uh, and also that evolution um, guarantees that these estimates are accurate. Um, so what this entails is that physical objects have causal powers. That's pretty obvious, right? Um, and also that brain activity causes consciousness. So it's, uh, consciousness is in this uh, viewpoint is considered to be epiphenomenal. Um, so let's think about questioning the assumptions. I'm just going to do this very briefly um, because everyone's quite familiar with, with how these assumptions get questioned. Um, first of all, is perception actually veridical? Um, uh, we, we have many, many illusions that show that it's not always veridical, but there are even other uh, more um, <coughs> uh, impressive kinds of demonstrations about the, the lack of veridicality of perception. Of course, perception scientists won't say that it's completely veridical. It's, um, you know, more or less veridical. But even then, this is an illusion. You're seeing bands of blue. There are no bands of blue. Okay? And, and there have been lots of other better illusions that have been shown in the last few days. Um, <clears throat> the other assumption is, does natural selection favor veridical perceptions? Uh, does natural selection favor them? Well, I, I just leave it to speak for itself. Here's a moose and a statue. And uh, I don't think the moose is going to be very happy. So <laughs> I, I thought the conference should introduce some sex somewhere. You know, it's, in, it's important. Uh, death, sex, you know, uh, anyway. So uh, a point of view that, that uh, you know, struck us as, as quite impressive is uh, Pinker's mention of uh, the fact that we're organisms, not angels, and our minds are organs, not pipelines to the truth. Our minds evolved by natural selection to solve problems that were life and death matters to our ancestors, not to commune with correctness. Um, and I want to elaborate on this idea. Um, <clears throat> so let's start with an evolutionary theory of perception. Let's accept the idea of evolution and start with that as uh, a, a basis for how perception evolved. Um, so I want to introduce two types of theories, physicalist evolutionary theories and interface evolutionary theories. Um, the physicalist evolutionary theories uh, state that our perceptions have evolved as veridical representations of the objective world, to repeat myself. Uh, and so veridical perceptions are those that are attuned to the structure of the world, whatever structures it has, including objects and their relationships. Um, <clears throat> The interface evolutionary theory, uh, the one I'm talking about was, was introduced by Don Hoffman, but I think this is as old as time. As we heard last night, for example, the Yogacharas had it, the Advaita Vedanta people had it. But even within the scientific area, uh, you know, pe many people have talked about it, more recently people like Kundarink and so forth. But um, this is the theory that our perceptions have evolved as a user interface between us and the objective world which is why the slide looks like a computer um, <coughs> monitor. Uh, interface perceptions then are not attuned to uh, the structure of the real world, if any. Or, well, there is one, but whatever it is. But they're attuned to evolutionary fitness, OK? Um, so 
what is evolutionary fitness? Just, I'm going to take a very simplistic point of view about that, but um, <clears throat> I, I think it suffices for this, for our purposes here. Here's a slab of meat. It is high fitness for the lion. It is very low fitness for the rabbit. And now the lion, of course, is confused. Uh, doesn't know which one to go for first. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that we, we have an understanding of what fitness is, is basically uh, in the theories that the way we're going to apply it is it's going to be very simple. Um, oh, I think I skipped a slide, but it'll come, I'll come back to fitness in a moment. Okay, so I just want to reiterate what the interface theory uh, uh, says. It says that space-time is akin to a desktop. It's, it's the arena in which things happen for us, okay? Um, <clears throat> physical objects are akin to icons on the desktop. And this is the analogy. Um, icons seem to interact via physical law, and this is why I used the word seem earlier. Somebody object, objected to it. He's not here. Um, icons seem to interact via physical law, but physical causality is a fiction. These are icons on a desktop. They're on an interface. They have something to do with the real world, but they're an interface. Physical causality is a fiction, but we take it, uh, we don't take it serious, uh, sorry, literally, but we do take it seriously. I mean, there's often an objection, well, if physical causality is a fiction and everything's a desktop, then would you, uh, would you jump in front of a train since the train's not really there? Um, well, the way I answer that is my icon should not step in front of the icon of a train because I've evolved to understand that that's going to be very, very poor fitness for me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just briefly, uh, the kinds of mathematics that, is, that goes into uh, models of perception, cognition, and consciousness that I'm, I'm going to be employing over here are um, evolutionary game theory, which is a theory of replication, retention, and selection. And the point about this is that it's ontologically neutral. Uh, evolutionary game theory does not have to be supported by classical physics or anything else. It's just the, uh, whether evolution has a purpose or not, it's the mechanism for the adaptation of any species, however you define species. It doesn't have to be a biological species. It could be a species of software. Uh, but uh, it's, it's the mechanism for its adaptation to the world, okay? Um, <clears throat> I'm also going to be employing some combinatorics, probability theory, and Bayesian inference. Of course, I'm just going to show you the results. I'm not going to show you the details of how I do this. Um, and uh, I'll be briefly talking about group theory and geometry. Um, <clears throat> I probably should have thrown in linear algebra and quantum mechanics, but uh, Mauro already talked about that extremely well. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, uh, categories and network theory is something that I'd love to see employed in this area. I'm not going to talk about it. We had a very nice talk by Dr. Wang last evening about this subject, and hopefully the next time we meet, I'll have more to say. Um, <clears throat> so, in the first part, I want to show that under natural selection and assuming an objective world, the probability of ridicule perception is close to zero. So, I, this is a sort of a reductio ad absurdum. I'm going to assume what we normally assume as physicalists. And I'm going to apply some mathematical uh, analysis to see that this doesn't work. Um, it, it sort of seems to contradict itself. Um, in particular, I'm going to state six fitness beats truth theorems. Um, <clears throat> the first, the main theorem that I, I'll uh, talk about is the one that says that interface agents, as I defined them before, dominate agents seeing the truth. Um, <clears throat> and in the second part, I'll introduce a proposal of how we should go about uh, dealing with this issue, which is uh, the, uh, the theory of conscious agents and invention of structure in the world. Uh, I'll be talking about an invention of space theorem, which is that conscious agents, as I'm going to define them, um, impute spatial structure to the world, uh, a structure that the world may not have. It may have it, but it, it need not. Uh, and the invention of probability theorem or invention of uh, really measure theoretic uh, structure theorem, which is that conscious agents impute probabilistic structure to the world. Again, something that it may not have. Um, so to talk about the very first theorem about interface agents versus uh, truth agents, <clears throat> uh, I, I'm going to just briefly tell you about the assumptions. Since this is a math conference, this is the most important basis on which we form everything. 
uh, the states of the world will form a set W, uh, which we'll take to be a compact regular Borel space, which has nice properties, which allow perception scientists to draw conclusions. Um, and if you don't know what that is, just think of it as a closed rectangle uh, in, in some Euclidean space. Um, and then the perceptual space of a given species is we're going to take it to be some finite set X. Okay, um, we have, as far as I know, a finite number of uh, pixels in our, uh, that we can see uh, through. So uh, the, the world has, a, has an a priori uh, probability measure on its measurable events. And we're going to assume that um, uh, this measure is absolutely continuous with respect to the uniform measure, it's various technical stuff. But what, what that does is that, first of all, it, it applies to the majority of situations studied in biological and perceptual sciences, and it allows us to use Bayesian inf inference. Um, so that's really what this structure is there for. Um, <clears throat> in modeling perceptual st strategies, having uh, um, a world and a perceptual space, we're going to define a perceptual strategy as something that assigns a percept to each world state. So it's a function which takes world states to things that light up in your perceptual space. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to sit down occasionally. Okay. So um, a general perceptual strategy actually, uh, as studied in, in cognitive science in particular, is a little bit more sophisticated. It allows for dispersion of perceptions and percepts. Uh, and so it's really a Markovian kernel uh, in some sense. Uh, uh, not in some sense, it is a Markovian kernel. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, most of the time I will take it just to be a function, which is a direct measure Markovian kernel. Okay, it's just a, what I call a punctual Markovian kernel. Um, <clears throat> okay, so as I was going to tell you a long time ago, it's suspenseful. What is fitness? Fitness is uh, something that is, it's, it's a number which is specific to a species. It's specific to the environment for that species. And it's specific to whichever action class we're interested in, in, in terms of this, the action of the species. And given these, it assigns to each world state W a positive number, which is its fitness. So it's, it's just a function which takes uh, non-negative values. Um, so introducing the perceptual strategies in more depth, uh, here we have uh, the world. Uh, here's uh, the perceptual space. Here's a point in the perceptual space. P is your perceptual mapping, and P inverse X over here is the phi, what I call the fiber above X. Okay, it's a set of world states that could have given rise to um, the percept X. So the ridicule or truth strategy uses first Bayes' theorem to estimate for each possible percept X a maximum a posteriori world state, W sub X, okay? Um, it's the element W sub X of the fiber above it, which maximizes the density of the measure uh, in the world. Okay, so for each X is a W sub X, and it's computed from this, uh, from Bayes' formula, which in this context looks like this. Um, <clears throat> the truth strategy then chooses that percept X naught that maximizes the fitness of its map state, maximum a priori state. So you, you, you go over all the X's, uh, you, you, over all the X's, you look for, for that X naught that maximizes the fitness. Okay, so both Bayes' formula or theorem and fitness are involved in these strategies, of course. Um, so let's see, W X naught would be the maximum and corresponding to that, there's a particular uh, <clears throat> point X naught in X. Now, the, the, the game I'm talking about over here is a resource game. So uh, you can think of the species as roaming around in what it sees. Um, it, it sees all this, and, it, and there are various different areas where one of which will have uh, a, a resource that it's looking for, which is most useful for its own fitness. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, setting in which I'm doing this. What's an interface strategy? Well. Interface strategies first compute the average fitness of the fiber over each X of the perceptual map. They're not really interested in the maximum a posteriori world state because they don't care about the structure of the world. They care about fitness and survival, okay? So they look at that, and how do they do that? Well, the average fitness of all world states that give rise via the perceptual strategy P to X 
is the average over the fiber, and that's also given by Bayes' formula. Okay, it's just that we're not looking for the maximum in the same way. Okay, so um, having done that, the second part of its strategy is to choose that percept x naught that maximizes the average fitness of its fiber. Okay, so <coughs> question, and that's, sorry, that's the formula. And then the question is which strategy dominates? Okay. Um, <coughs> well, in order to figure that out, uh, we're going to be using, as I said, evolutionary game theory. And uh, an evolutionary game between two strategies, in this case, interface and truth, uh, has a payoff matrix, which is defined as follows. Each of the entries in the matrix is a payoff to the strategy on the left when, when, when um, playing against the strategy on top. This is standard game theory. Um, <clears throat> then we would conclude, I'm sort of loading the dice here, that interface would dominate truth if um, A is bigger than C and B is bigger than D. At least one of these is a, is a strict inequality and, and uh, they're both inequalities, okay? Um, so, uh, so the payoffs to the first player uh, always exceed, uh, so to interface, the payoffs to one strategy as the first player always exceed those of the other strategy as the first player. So that's a standard game theory model. Um, <clears throat> so that's the minor point. Uh, this is a slide I'm going to slip over very rapidly uh, because either you know it or you don't. And um, I'd be glad to talk about it later, but the, the basic idea in, in evolutionary game theory is to talk about the proportion of species using each strategy and uh, then define a fitness for each strategy according to the, the payoffs. This is expected fitness in terms of the payoffs and the proportions of the species. And that leads to a replicator equation, which is a differential equation that tells you uh, how these proportions are going to change. Um, and this equation, interestingly enough, has a certain number of possible um, asymptotic behaviors. Uh, you, you have stable points. So for example, in the, in the very first one, you have uh, that <coughs> uh, this, this is a stable point, but it's, un I mean, it's an unstable equilibrium, sorry. And here's a stable equilibrium. If, if uh, as in the previous slide, a is bigger than C and B is bigger than D, then, then even if you start here and you introduce one member of the other species, it will eventually go dominate and eliminate species B. Um, so this is the selection dynamics. Uh, this applies, the, the, the stuff I'm telling you applies to infinitely large populations, but we've studied this for finite populations too. And uh, this, everything works, but I'm just giving you an example of what works for how it goes for infinite populations. Um, the first theorem then is that interface strategies mostly dominate truth strategies. <laughs> okay, so we consider a world W and a finite sensorium X as we have over all possible fitness functions and all possible a priori probability measures on W. Uh, the probability that an interface or the likelihood is probably a better word, that an interface perceptual strategy will dominate a veridical strategy is at least given by this. So uh, where, where that's the size of the sensorium. So this is, as many people have said to me, very counterintuitive. Um, okay, it's funny though, I mean, cognitive scientists say that this is counterintuitive, but many biologists say, yeah, what's the big deal? You know, it's interesting how they have different sorts of education. Um, so what does this mean? It means that um, <clears throat> as the size of the perceptual space increases to infinity, the probability with which the interface strategies dominate veridical strategies goes to one, generically in all possible situations. Um, but even if it's not, even if it's fairly large, I mean, uh, how many rods and cones do we have? Uh, it, you, you, you know, it's pretty close to one. And most of the time, the interface strategy is going to dominate uh, the, uh, the veridical strategy. Then I've also recently, we, we've worked out a, a bunch of structure theorems. Um, they all have this same template, 
which is the following. If you take, we're now going to consider a finite world um, and a finite number, a finite uh, perceptual space over here. And um, for each type of structure, we're going to compute an admissibility ratio. Uh, and by that, I mean among the possible fitness functions from the world to uh, the sensorium that are homomorphisms of a given structure then rho is the ratio of the number of homomorphisms to the number of those that achieve maximum fitness value. Okay. Um, and actually, even homomorphisms that achieve maximum fitness value. Uh, I didn't quite point that out, but it's, it's a stronger, these are stronger results than what it says here. Um, so the second theorem is that interface agents dominate agents that veridically observe total order. Um, we just took a few a number of uh, types of structure and asked ourselves, well, would these be eliminated in a, in a competitive evolutionary game or not? And uh, in this case, in, when it comes to total order, that admissi admissibility ratio goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And even if m r increases in size with n, that's still true. Okay, And that's the formula that uh, combinatorically is computed for uh, the admissibility ratio. We did some experiments using Mathematica to see uh, how it works if, if, if it's not quite a homomorphism, if uh, you know, we make it a little fuzzy, and it turns out to be very robust under approximation. Um, <clears throat> the third theorem is the same thing happens when you look at permutation group behavior, okay, or, or structure, really. Um, in this case, again, rho goes to zero. Um, here we have to take m equals n because it doesn't make sense otherwise. Um, the, the formula, of course, is a little bit different, but again, it's very robust under approximation. So this could apply to uh, finite uh, approximations to the Euclidean group, for example. Um, <clears throat> the fourth theorem, and now it gets a little interesting, is that, that uh, the periodic, uh, sorry, did I say, uh, let me just go back here. Uh, not I, the next thing I said I'm going to say applies to uh, approximations of the Euclidean group. So <coughs> um, cyclic group behavior is the same. Again, rho goes to zero as the size of the world increases. Um, but now it's it's not quite as robust. It does break down. It, it, it it's fairly it's a little bit robust, but not terribly. <laughs> Okay, and it does break down if it's approximate. So some uh, types of structure may be um, supported evolutionarily. And the next one actually is, the most, is very interesting to me uh, because whether you uh, want to start with probabilities or end with probabilities, I don't see Bob here, but he likes to end with them. Um, <laughs> but you know, either way, uh, measurable spaces are sort of important to us, in whether we're talking classical or quantum. And it turns out that in this case, again, the admissibility ratio goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So uh, <clears throat> that structure is not supported by evolutionary uh, game theory, but actually it sort of is. Because even if you have the slightest um, sloughing off from real homomorphism, it breaks down. Now, I think this is a good thing because I think that science would not be possible if we couldn't talk about measure theory and probability. So, so, so it's, it's not that nothing exists and everything we see is, is you know, fake. I'm, I'm not saying that. Uh, okay, we're left to do things like topological or other structures. It would be lovely to have an overarching theory, perhaps coming uh, in a, from a categorical perspective, but the, the individual results are very different. So I'm not sure how to, how to push that, but we'll see. Okay, so that's the end of uh, the theorems. And we take, I take this, the implication of this to say that our physical vocabulary is an, as an extension of our perceptual vo vocabulary. After all, we use our percepts to do physics, uh, ex at least experimentally. Um, is the wrong vocabulary for the causal structure of the world. Okay. Um, I may or may not have convinced anyone. Let's see, what sort of time do we have? Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty picture, actually. Okay, 
So you might object to the domination theorem or theorems by saying there is consistent agreement on things like 3D shapes, textures, etc. We've actually had these discussions all the way through. Uh, how can you say that these are fictions of our interface? Um, well, uh, these are very strong intuitions and let me go out on a limb and say that they are dead false. Um, <clears throat> a, a theorem that I'm going to introduce later says that an agent can see spatial properties in the world whether the world actually has the structure or not, of course, based on uh, the definition of a conscious agent. So it's qua that. Okay, similarly with probabilistic structures. Um, thanks. I'm doing pretty well, actually. I'm, I'm more than halfway through. If evolution favors interfaces as perceptual strategies, and if, for example, space is a construction of a species-dependent mind, the interfaces depend on the species, and that's something to bear in mind as we go along with all this. Um, do other species have consciousness? Um, some people would say, I don't know, and I would say, of course. Are there species that we don't know that are conscious? Maybe. Um, so this invites us to start anew in developing a model of consciousness. Okay, and I. Much as I love neuroscience, personally, and I love physics, uh, and I will always do as much as I can in physics and mathematics and mathematical physics and learn more of it, and uh, it's my interface, it, it, it describes my interface, and I love my interface, I, I have to say that, that we have not, um, <clears throat> over 50 years of, of hard work and some very brilliant ideas, which I think have tremendous value in any case, but we've not been able to explain what the taste of a cashew nut is as a feeling, how that arises from the brain. Now, we had uh, people before say that we're very close to it. Uh, the wonderful talk uh, which involved uh, uh, automata and, and, and as, a, as a toy model showing that uh, we're very, very close to, to demonstrating uh, feelings, but very close doesn't quite cut it. We haven't done it. So I think at some point we have to ask ourselves, um, maybe we should look at things another way. It doesn't mean we should stop doing what we're doing. I think it's extremely valuable. Every judge in the country wants to know what fee really means. Every doctor wants to know uh, what fee means, what microtubules do. I mean, it's, it's, this, this is important for our fitness. There's no question about that. And I, I would... Uh, but, but the, you know, the, the thing is that for all practical purposes, we can be phys physicalists until we start to try to develop a theory of consciousness. I mean, physicalism makes perfect sense for us because it's our interface. It, it's how we function in life. But when we start to theorize and try to produce a theory of consciousness, that's when we run into trouble. And um, so uh, now begins part two which is that a conscious agent interacts with its world. What is a conscious agent? Okay. And of course, many people have many ideas about this, and this is one proposal, and uh, hopefully it's entirely falsifiable, and it'll, it'll, it'll evolve, and it'll develop, or it'll be demolished, one or the other. Um, well, our model of a conscious agent is uh, formally uh, something that, that has experiences, which we take to be qualia. Okay, I'll say that up front. Experiences lead to actions in the world, and these actions are done on a world. Okay, and then the world also um, excites further experiences. Okay, um, I'm actually taking this wasn't clear in our earlier work, but I'm actually taking the world to include the agent. And I want to see how that works, actually. And I, I, I think you can do that within the same structure. Okay, so, um, so in, in uh, symbolic terms, um, P is a perceptual map from the world to the space of experiences, which is X. D is a decision map, which takes uh, experiences to um, decisions which we're calling G for provocative reason. And then A is the, uh, is the action map that takes decisions and acts with them upon the world. Um, <clears throat> and N is simply a counter, as we had yesterday evening, 
um, just updating whenever something happens, things happen sequentially for this conscious agent. Okay, so this seven tuple is what is a conscious agent. Um, and uh, it's, it's really something which is inspired by cognitive science. Uh, uh, Professor Dariano is, is very keen to, um, uh, has, I think, convinced me that I need to look at this guy a little bit more closely. All right. Um, this part of the, of the conscious agent, the X, the D, and the G, are, in, are the internal part of the agent. Uh, and so we call that a reduced conscious agent. If you just ignore the world and whatever else is happening, uh, that, that's, the, that's the internal part. I think it's a better word than reduced. Um, and it's, it's understandable that P and A uh, can be Markov kernels because uh, interaction with the world tends to be a classical interaction or is a classical interaction. What happens internally could well be quantal. Okay, so I'm not wedded to what I'm going to say just now about what D is as a Markov kernel, but I just wanted to point out that, that, that is, th this part is probably the first place where we might want to generalize. Uh, so far as it goes, this model um, actually does work very well for cognitive science. Uh, so we take WXG to be measure spaces, N is an integer, a, a non-negative integer, if you want to start at zero. And P, D, and A are Markov kernels, or maybe something uh, more applicable to the particular kind of agency that we're looking at. Um, so this conscious agent is given by this, and to be a little bit more general, we want to talk not so much about uh, instance of uh, experience, but we want to talk about changes in experience. And so for uh, the, this Markov kernel P, uh, and th this is the answer for yesterday's question, the, this Markov kernel P is, uh, depends on two initial variables. For each prior experience and current world state W, the new experience is going to be given by this probability. Okay, and for most of this talk, I'm going to take this to be uh, actually a, a punctual thing. In other words, this is a Dirac kernel. And I'm also probably uh, sometimes going to for forget the previous state. I'll call that a forgetful kernel. But uh, sometimes I'll come back to the general uh, definition. Similarly for the decision kernel, uh, it's, it's based on the previous decision as well as the current experience, and then gives you a new decision. And the um, <coughs> action kernel, is based on, uh, up here, is based on a previous uh, action, uh, uh, sorry, a previous world state, and changes that world state based on the current decision, the current decided upon action. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the, as a minimal definition, these are measure spaces as before, but these are just measurable functions, okay? Um, I didn't say measurable, but they have to be measurable here. <coughs> and it's a, it's a sort of a, a, a toy model, an easier way to think about these things. Um, <coughs> I believe everything I'm going to say applies to the general situation also. So the conscious agent thesis then is the thesis that the activities of every conscious entity can be modeled by conscious agents. Okay. Um, that somehow this minimal structure, this parsimonious structure, has to do with any kind of activity of a conscious agent. Um, all right, so that's the basic definition of conscious agents. And I uh, want to mention two theorems based on this definition. <clears throat> They're very uh, simple to prove, uh, but uh, of course it takes all this definition and everything to, to, to state them. And the first one is about the invention of space. So what do I mean by space? Just very briefly, I mean that there's a manifold of points with uh, some kind of a metric on it, together with a group of isometries or a, a symmetry group in general acting on S, okay? And there are various, uh, I mean, uh, hordes of examples of this sort of thing, but I'm taking this Kleinian point of view of space in a very general sense, okay? Um, but the key point over here is that there's a group of, there's a group which is a symmetry group acting on the space. Okay, um, and examples are Euclidean group acting on, on three-dimensional space or the Lorentz group acting on Minkowski four space and so forth. Um, and many, many you know, non-Euclidean examples and so forth. 
Um, so the second theorem goes like this, and I, I think I'll slow down a bit to explain this. Um, this is the invention of space theorem. It says that if a conscious agent's actions form a group, they just happen to be a group. So G happens to be a group. And if that agent's perceptions are tuned, which I'll define on the next slide, to its actions, okay, so if its, its perceptions here are tuned to its actions, then the agents will see the geometrical space for that group. Its view of the world will be that the world is, you know, a, a, a space, a, a, a G space. So, uh, it, I mean, it's really, once you set it up, it's almost trivial. Uh, suppose that a conscious agent's action space G is a group. The action of A on G, of G on the world need not be a group action. This is the key point. It need not be a group action. In other words, uh, the, uh, if you have a world point W, and maybe I should draw this, but I'll just, I'll just hand wave. If you have a world point W and you act on it with G, you get a new world point. You act on that with H, you get a new world point. And if you act on that world point with H following G, in other words, if you act on W with HG, not HG, you act on it with HG, you get a different point. So it's not a group action. It's a group action if you get the same point, okay, uh, the same world state. So it need not be a group action. But suppose, though, that G happens to be a symmetry group for the agent's perceptual space. How could that happen? Well, I think evolution is a very good way for things like that to come about, okay? Um, so suppose that, uh, that G is a symmetry group for the perceptual space, and we'll, we'll write the action of G on, on X, any particular point in there, as G dot X. Um, then for a current world state W and a given G uh, in the group, the new world state is A of GW. I'm taking this to be the punctual case, just for simplicity. Um, if the perceptual channel and the action channel are attuned, that is for the current percept percept x and the next percept x prime, we have that x prime is given by g dot x, uh, which would have to comport with what p and a do to g and w and x. So suppose you have this structure, suppose this has evolved this way, okay, then um, essentially the percept, perception action experiences of this observer will admit g as a group of symmetries acting on what this observer sees in the world, which is the set of fibers of the perceptual map. Okay, so it, that's all it can see of the world is, is, is a collection of fibers. It doesn't see the details of the fibers. That's what we see, <laughs> okay. It, it can Im impute stuff, it can imagine things, but that's what we see. Um, so uh, if, if, you, if that, given that, um, the next theorem is that an observer sees I mean, sorry, this, uh, this just summarizes what I said. It's the agent that has this structure. Um, the world may not have this structure, okay? So that's what I call imputation. Uh, invention of probabilistic structure is somewhat similar. Again, suppose you just had uh, a situation like this where you had uh, a measurable set X and a measurable set G and, and some Markov kernel between them. Uh, this is the internal part of the observer, which is all nice and measurable and so forth. And the world is not necessarily so. Um, <clears throat> suppose W is any set. Uh, P is any function from W to X, not necessarily measurable. Um, G is any, uh, A is any function from G to W. Um, then, and we're not asserting measurability for these extra guys. But the fact is that, it's a very simple fact in measure theory, that P uh, induces uh, a measure back on W. It pulls, pulls it back, all right? And then if this, if this function A, or if this uh, kernel A, is measurable with respect to the measure structure of G and this pulled back measure structure on W, that the one that's induced by P, then we will say that, uh, then, then it, this is a conscious agent, and the conscious agent is going to see that measurable structure in the world. So, um, all this suggests that perhaps, you know, if, if the physical world is, is now not as objective as we thought, and it, it, and it seems to be part of an interface, then perhaps what we should think about is instead of the hard, the traditional mind-body or traditional hard problem, 
um, that the physical world is fundamental in consciousness, how does consciousness arise from it? We propose the reverse mind-body problem, uh, which is, I think, at least as hard. How do we derive the physical from consciousness? Um, <clears throat> taking consciousness as fundamental, okay? Um, if you're going to take consciousness as fundamental, then uh, the conscious realism thesis expresses that fact by saying that the world consists of conscious agents and their interactions. That is the world. That's the objective world. The world that we see is on an interface. And it is a result of interaction with the objective world and the evolution of the human species, which happens to agree on a lot of things, but doesn't agree with ants um, or borgs or other such creatures. Um, so that's my introduction to conscious agent theory and uh, the motivation and the introduction for it. I just want to end in the last seven minutes with some suggestions about where we should go from here. Um, uh, one of the questions which is really fundamental throughout cognitive science, and, uh, and I believe in, in conscious science, consciousness sciences, is, is the question of combination. The combination of qualia, the combination of agents to produce higher level agents. In fact, uh, how can we develop a whole hierarchy of agents? Or given an agent, how can we understand that as being uh, uh, instantiated by a hierarchy of agents below it? I mean, I personally believe that I am a conscious agent, and I, I suspect that each one of you is. Um, I strongly suspect it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be, I'd be a solipsist and I'd be really lonely. Um, but, I, I, but by you, I, I understand that it's not what I'm looking at. It's something much, much deeper than that. And uh, each of us has, um, uh, is really a combination of an extremely sophisticated array of conscious agents. Um, so when I lose consciousness, for example, there, there's a lot of me that hasn't lost consciousness. Uh, in fact, I had that experience rather recently. Um, and the, the lot of me that wasn't uh, losing consciousness was, was still functioning parts of my body. <laughs> okay. In fact, we know that every night. Um, so how do conscious agents combine statically or dynamically to produce new conscious agents? And in fact, uh, how do conscious agents evolve? This is a crucial question uh, because we want to understand how interfaces come about. How do interfaces either develop in combination to become more sophisticated interfaces or interfaces more, uh, or, or maybe more precise interfaces, or um, what does evolution has to have to do with this? And I'm not talking about biological evolution anymore. Biological evolution is something that happens on, a, on our human interface, and which may well be a projection on it of an evolution of consciousness itself. Um, we'd like to be able to build circuits of conscious agents and so that we can explore the dynamics of, of interaction. It's, it's, I think we mentioned this uh, earlier that the dynamics of conscious interaction is really, it's in that process that evolution of interfaces can come about. Uh, so uh, we'd like to explore their properties. Uh, uh, networks of conscious agents are Turing complete and so forth. The, they, they have all those properties, but uh, what else? Um, and we'd like to be able to describe various uh, important areas of cognitive science in particular, like memory, predictive coding, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> there has been s some initial work in that uh, direction. I just wanted to provoke you with this picture that, you, that this is a form of instantiation and this can go all the way down. You can always fit conscious agents in conscious agents. All right, that, that's the simple way of doing it. Okay, the, the, I'm sure that there are more sophisticated structures. I keep hearing in my head the word co-cone, but I'm just learning this stuff right now. So, so I, I, can't, I can't say anything about it just yet. Um, <clears throat> so another way to describe the conscious realism thesis is that the world of any conscious agent is a circuit of conscious agents. And that's the, the rest of the world, if you like, or even the world including me, is a circuit of conscious agents 
all in interaction with each other, um, all influencing each other in some very, very sophisticated way, which for a given conscious agent um, is not actually Markovian, even though it's built up out of Markovian things, because it's interacting with the rest of the world. And so I'm not, I, I would love to see quantum theory coming out of this, uh, but I'm not yet convinced that I have to put it in to begin with. Uh, it might work that way. All right, but I, I'm, I'm wondering if there's some more diagrammatic way for quantum theory to, to emerge as a combination of conscious agents. So, I don't know yet. Um, there is also a notion of, just within Markov chain theory, there's a very interesting notion of asymptotic agents. Uh, suppose you had two, um, suppose you had two conscious agents and they're loosely interacting. Occasionally they interact, mostly they're, they're or the circuits are interacting with themselves, but the, the agents themselves, uh, I mean, sorry, the two circuits are loosely interacting with each other. Um, so the agents in interacting with themselves do form a Markov chain. If it's a closed loop, it forms a Markov chain, if you define it correctly. And that Markov chain has asymptotic behavior. And if it's a Harris chain in particular, the asymptotic behavior is, it has this cyclical behavior inside each asymptotic set. Um, so in this, in this interaction, what could happen is that if one chain has already achieved its asymptotic behavior, and so has the other chain, and then they have an interaction, they might, that interaction might flip them to a different asymptotic behavior, you see? So the asymptotic behavior now becomes an interface of a combination agent. It's a much simpler agent, but it's a combination which is defined in, in, in terms of an infinite trajectory of uh, agents at this level. This is just a provocative idea. I'm not saying that it's gone anywhere, though it, it is a bit intriguing. Uh, Don Hoffman really loves it because it, 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 it seems to, um, sorry, I'll go back again. It seems to, uh, the results seem to look like uh, a free particle in quantum mechanics, but um, I'm not so convinced <laughs> personally. <laughs> anyway, um, if I claim that space-time is uh, a description uh, is a coordinatization of the desktop, then I have to show how space-times emerge. And our idea about this is that they emerge as efficient coding schemes from the interaction of conscious agents. Now, once we, when we came up with this idea, we, we then saw some physics papers where a very similar idea was, was proposed, uh, and similar not in terms of conscious agents, <laughs> but, but in terms of, of various other kinds of uh, physical entities that give rise to space-time. You know, you get, you get provocative statements from Arkani Hamed, uh, for example, just, he says that space-time is dead. There's much more sophisticated structures of which that is, uh, you know, a, a facet, uh, sort of a facet. Okay. Um, so our idea is that you can, you know, in order to make sense of this incredibly rich interaction with other conscious agents, we need to be able to compress the uh, information coming into us and the information space that we're inundated with. And we'd like to be able to deal with it. And so we've chosen to use as a first step uh, uh, a geometric algebra for the, for the compression. Um, and, and a very simple toy example is that if you have two interacting m-bit conscious agents, so each of these is m-bits, um, then the interaction space is just the product space of all uh, of, of these six things, sorry, seven things. Um, and the, the perceptual map for, of each agent is the action map of the other agent. I mean, when I'm talking to you, I'm performing an action, you're receiving a perception. Um, and of course, there's another n prime. Yeah, so all these uh, uh, become part of the state of the uh, interaction space. And the compression mapping that we proposed, uh, just exploring, I should say, is uh, a compression into uh, a six-dimensional algebra uh, with signature 2, 4, which happens to be a conformal geometric algebra for space-time with signature 1, 3. I mean, it, we thought, let's give that a try. It seems to be what we as humans see. So, so let's try this particular one. And uh, the mapping in particular is the mapping kappa, which goes into this uh, uh, space-time 
uh, with this, uh, sorry, into six dimensional algebra with the signature, but over a finite field so that we can do computations on this. So the, the, the field is of size p, and the, uh, the mapping looks like this. It's a very simple mapping. It's just you, you're sending each variable uh, into the coordinate of one of the basis vectors for this geometric algebra. And uh, what we see, let me just, I'm out of time, so I'm going to skip this slide and go to this one. Uh, here uh, is the information space, the, the amount of information is coming in in a certain number of, uh, this is the, the cardinality of the set of geometric algebra operators in orange uh, for vectors, uh, and the information operators are in blue, the cardinality of the information operators. So you can see that this is rising very, very rapidly as the dimension, you should only look at the whole numbers here, please, but as the dimension is increasing, uh, the compression mapping does a serious amount of compression. Okay, so it's a proposal that this is the sort of way in which sp uh, space-time might emerge. Um, I'm almost done. I uh, claimed before that objects are uh, icons on an interface. It's our task to show that these, are, these arise as satisficing solutions to a fitness landscape of a species. Satisficing means it doesn't have to be the most, the survival of the fittest. That's a bit of a misunderstanding. Uh, um, but it, it just has to compete favorably against all other strategies. Okay, so it's, it's the next task. And um, quantum decision kernels I already mentioned before as a possibility. Uh, and um, I, I've mentioned this already. Is, and so here are some very speculative questions, a couple of them. Is physical law, if physical law is something that happens on a human interface, is it immutable as consciousness itself evolves, if consciousness is indeed first? This is a question that arises in this context, okay? It wouldn't arise in a physical, physicalist context. Um, what drives, in fact, if, if anything does drive the evolution of consciousness, what is it that drives it? I mean, I'm not going to say that, you know, mathematical, uh, uh, evolutionary game theory drives consciousness. I'm sorry, I think, I, I'd like to think that, that consciousness gave rise to mathematical game theory and it's, and it's a good one. It's not something, it's something that's good, has high fitness for our species as in fact mathematics in general does. But what drives the evolution of consciousness? And here we're, uh, one of the best answers I've, I've come across I got from Federico Fegin, who's actually one of the uh, benefactors of this conference, and uh, he said to me, he said, it's the urge for self-knowing. It's the urge to have that aha experience, the joy of aha, which we all as scientists have experienced. But, I, I, you know, that's the urge for the evolution of consciousness. So I think that I'm done. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>